platform. She's an associate professor of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Loyola University. She's a staff physician also at the VA hospital. She's going to be talking about an engineer's perspective in neurosurgery and vice versa. You know, Dr. Papu did that her bachelor's in mathematics at the University of Miami, did a PhD at MIT, and then uh, became a postdoctoral fellow at Yale, then stayed there for medical school, became also a uh, postdoctoral fellow at that time uh, between diagnostic radiology, and then eventually a uh, resident in surgery at Yale between 2005-2007, and then went on to uh, New Mexico where he did more surgery and then a residency in neurosurgery. And uh, she's been uh, first in New Mexico as a faculty and then most recently, recently since 2018 in uh, neurosurgery at Loyola University, multiple awards, multiple uh, recognitions, uh, not only as a mentor, as a surgeon, as a teacher, as a scholar, uh, multiple publications. Dr. Papu, as you can see, for all our residents, our fellows, our um, faculty, we follow not only their publications, but also their impact on the literature. So uh, our team puts all this presentation together. This is really our group of fellows. Uh, I know you've been interacting already with uh, Dr. Ramos, with Andres, who coordinates the scheduling and stuff. These are all uh, extraordinary young physicians who are doing a lot of research and work on behalf of our department. So they put this presentation. So, you know, impact early on uh, in the literature is important for us because that's how we measure. Those are the few of the metrics that we follow in the three shields, research, education, and patient care. So we are delighted to have you. We're looking forward to your remarks and I'm going to stop sharing this right here. So I let you go ahead and um, do your presentation so you can share whatever you need to, so you have access to this. Thank you so much, Dr. Q. Um, let me just take a second to um, get my talk uh, shared over here. Um, but I do need to take some help in, let's see, I have to, do, I have to share a screen, I think, before I go to that. Uh, there I go. Are you able to see that? Yeah, we see okay. the presentation. Okay, perfect. Uh, here we go. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak this morning. Um, as uh, Dr. Q mentioned, I've, uh, my early career was actually not in medicine. And um, my first language, as it were, um, was in quantitative methods. And um, being in neurosurgery, I like to um, be able to look at some of the problems that we have we face in neurosurgery from that perspective um, to see if there's some different way that we can model the problems. Um, I have one disclosure. Um, so broadly as a neurosurgeon, if you're meeting an engineer, you might say, I have a problem that needs a solution. If you're an engineer, you may say, Actually, I have a lot of solutions and um, let me see uh, what kind of problems you have. So I think that we have a partnership between these two people can uh, permit a unique perspective. Um, and the problem that I wanna speak about is uh, one of the most challenging problems um, in neurosurgery. That's the problem that we face um, at the level of neurocritical care. Um, here we have a patient that uh, literally has every um, tube that you can think of, many, many monitors. Um, and this is a very, very difficult problem of trying to manage perturbed physiology. We see this most frequently um, in the setting of traumatic brain injury and in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here, here's all this data that we're collecting um, and the question is, how do we um, start to uh, make sense of this? How do we um, direct our management of this? So the questions that you might be asking is something about to, about to happen. Should I be worried? If you're a resident, you might say, should I call my attending? And the most important thing is you've admitted this patient, you're doing your rounds, or you know, the patient may have just been admitted, and you're counseling the family. And the family says, 
doctor, how is my, my loved family member going to do? And uh, because uh, neurosurgery is such a long residency, we start to develop some intuition um, about this, but it would be great if we were able to say this in a little bit more of a systematic way. The, the terminology that we use to try to get some sense about whether um, somebody's doing well or poorly is cerebral autoregulation. It's, it's something in uh, a neurocritical care setting that we talk about frequently. Um, and uh, I just wanna go through a little bit of the background of, of what that means and how it corresponds to how we um, think of patients. So um, on the left here, we have uh, a normal brain and we see um, over here on the x-axis, we have arterial blood pressure, and then we have the blood flow along the y-axis. And in particular, we know that uh, for a normal brain, across a wide range of blood pressures, there's really no change in the blood flow. It's really only in the setting of extreme hypotension or extreme hypertension that there might be some impact in the blood flow. In the setting of an injured brain here on the right with the same axes, we see that e, the, this brain is, is quite fragile, frail, even a small change in blood pressure here can have a dramatic change on the blood flow of the brain. So that's kind of conceptually um, what we talk about when we talk about um, autoregulation. And uh, more specifically, that in the setting of um, intact autoregulation, that uh, a change in blood pressure, these oscillations have really no impact on um, the blood flow. Um, and in the loss of that, that every change in blood pressure has a correspondent change in blood flow. So you can think of this if you um, have a bit more of a statistical um, hat on, that there's really no correlation, that the blood pressure is changing here, and there's really no change in blood flow um, that you would uh, discern on, on the uh, y-axis, but there's a direct correlation here between um, any change in blood pressure to blood flow. So that is a linear relationship in the extreme. So why do we worry about autoregulation? In the, in the loss of that, we um, can encounter secondary injury, um, which is the very reason why we're keeping them in, a, in an ICU. This can uh, result in increased intracranial pressure, ischemia, seizures, mismatches in oxygen and uh, glucose delivery, really a metabolic failure. And um, certainly there's a sense that this can result in worse long-term outcomes. So if we were able to de uh, detect a disturbance in cerebral autoregulation um, uh, early, perhaps we can initiate some more proactive management and improve our outcomes. So the goals as a uh, as uh, a physician uh, monitoring somebody in the ICU, we'd like to know what the status is of autoregulation. We'd like to be able to prevent secondary injury and we'd, be able, we'd like to be able to identify who is at risk early. Um, the remainder of my talk is going to um, follow this. I'm gonna um, uh, review our basic notions of uh, neurophysiology, the intuition that we already have. I'd like to introduce some engineering terminology and sort of segue into um, a slightly different way of looking at um, this problem. Um, and then I'll talk about um, the experience that I had actually um, back in New Mexico and uh, a collaboration with an engineer, an electrical engineer who was a control systems um, specialists to um, see if we can predict outcomes in the setting of brain injury. I'll talk about limitations, next steps, and then um, if I have time to see um, how um, other hospitals might be able to have access to this data. So when we talk about uh, management of uh, physiology in the ICU, the, the very common uh, way that we talk about it is about cerebral perfusion pressure. And we all know that very familiar um, equation that it's arterial blood pressure minus I ICP. 
Um, however, a critical part of that that we don't, we intuitively know is an issue, um, but don't explicitly really know how to assess is cerebrovascular resistance. And so um, we can think of the resistance occurring, you know, at the arterial capillary phase of, um, of uh, circulation. And um, there's a sense that, um, that I, I've been leading up to that this blood pressure um, has some kind of autoregulatory mechanism. And then that is what causes um, the, the, the blood flow that we see. Um, and I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about that connection through cerebrovascular resistance. We know that in addition to the autoregulation mechanisms that there are metabolic components and neuronal uh, regulation. So here's our familiar relationship, cerebral perfusion pressure and its relationship to MAP and ICP. But um, I would also offer that through vascular resistance and blood flow, there's another uh, very critical um, relationship. So blood flow is equal to our perfusion pressure divided by the resistance. So intuitively we know if the resistance is very high in the brain, we're not gonna have a lot of blood flow and vice versa. So if we rearrange this equation, we get a perfusion pressure equal to blood flow um, multiplied by the resistance. Now, thinking of it in this terms, in these terms, the intuition is here we have our familiar MAP minus ICP equals perfusion pressure. And now we're also characterizing this as blood flow times resistance. So if you go way back to your pre-med classes, you'll uh, remember in physics, we talked about electrical circuits where voltage is equal to current by resistance, Ohm's law. And so what is voltage? Voltage is a potential difference, or in other words, it's a pressure that pushes current against a resistance. So here's a, a circuit depiction of that, but it starts to give some intuition about why you might want to think of our um, human physiology, neural physiology, and to model it as um, something like this and how that might lead us to look at different ways of um, assessing this. So um, if, if you put a blood flow uh, monitor into the, the parenchyma of the brain, you can directly measure uh, the blood flow. Um, Hemodex uh, makes some device that is often used in many ICUs, but more commonly, um, uh, we have access to transcranial Doppler and we measure flow velocities. It's non-invasive. It allows us to do these kind of studies on normal patients, not just uh, critically ill patients. However, much of the, and much of the literature is related to these non-invasive kind of measurements um, because the, um, there's a decision not to use a parenchymal blood flow monitor. So you can measure flow velocity. However, um, the literature does support that the changes in flow velocity can reflect changes in blood flow. And so I'll use that, I'll stipulate that um, and start with discussion about flow velocity and then um, uh, extrapolate to blood flow. So consider the problem of um, looking at blood pressure. X here is the time ax, uh, the time, uh, time is measured on the X axis. We can see the blood uh, pressure and below here we have a flow velocity. So this is uh, a TCD study. Um, and again, we're thinking that there's some auto-regulatory mechanism that's at hand uh, connecting the two. Now, the first person um, who really noticed this, interestingly enough, was Dr. Giller, and he published this in 1990 in the Red Journal. And I think there might even be some residents who weren't born at that time. Um, but what he noted was that by thinking in these electrical systems terms and using those techniques, what he noted was 
that um, there were correlations between the velocity and pressure waveforms in the frequency domain. So let's um, uh, go back to, again, that relationship that we talked about in subarachnoid hemorrhage, if there are correlations between blood pressure and uh, blood flow, it's somewhat linear. That's a high correlation in a statistical sense versus very poor correlation between those two. That's the flat part of the curve. So, so far we're pretty good. The only thing that we're worried about is frequency domain. This is an unfamiliar term to us um, in, um, in uh, medical fields in clinical medicine. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a side review of what that means and how that helps us and then see how direct application of that um, approach can help us to um, maybe answer the question about autoregulation. So we look over here at this graph, here's our x-axis time and an amplitude. And here's a waveform that looks pretty familiar to us from looking at our telemetry monitor. If we now look at it in the frequency domain, what we're looking at is how frequently is the sinusoidal wave uh, changing? And we can uh, create another axis sort of over here. Okay, so let's consider a sinusoidal wave here with a period T. Um, this is just repeating again and again. And so now we have a frequency at a certain level. So now if we have the uh, sinusoidal wave changing twice as fast, we see that the, the period associated with it is half. And now the frequency uh, representation is, is double. So again, if we have a, a waveform that's like super fast here, it generates and it's, it's just a single morphology you get one spike. If this is now a little bit more um, relaxed, indolent, you would see that the frequency spike is smaller. In this case, we have two waves that are um, overlapped with each other. It's a more complex kind of wave. And now we have two spikes. And so this is the key thing um, in, uh, that we're leading up to is how to convert from the time axis to the frequency. Uh, domain. So let's go back to our blood pressure and our blood flow velocity. If we think of um, W1, this is a sinusoidal wave. It is the solid wave as our input and the dashed line W2 as our output. Um, we, we can measure a few things. There's a little bit of a delay that's called a phase shift. And more significantly, we see that if there is that delay, so the amplitude um, of W1 is here and it re uh, results in, a, in an amplitude of W2 over here, that's that kind of damping effect between those two, right? And so what does that sound like? That sounds like an autoregulatory kind of mechanism. So here is um, a version of a blood pressure waveform, and here's a version of a blood flow waveform. And then here is the frequency along the x-axis now. And here is something that's called the power spectrum. And that captures how much of the blood pressure and the blood flow velocities occur within a, a given frequency. So the terminology that I want you to take away from this is gain. So gain is that change in, um, again, our sort of auto-regulatory mechanism um, uh, black box, basically. Spectral analysis is just a fancy way of talking about a frequency domain analysis. And you know, these are, are ways in which we can make that conversion from our time domain to our frequency domain. And then there are techniques for doing that. 
And now um, the terminology here is we have that input of blood pressure and it results in a frequency. We have that output of blood flow and that results in um, another frequency uh, domain representation. And then we have something called a cross spectral estimate. And that's the thing that really links the two together. So this is called transfer function analysis. So you have an input output system that is amenable to frequency domain analysis. And in the engineering world, it is, and uh, the physiology world, um, it is something that is well uh, known. This was a, an article that was a review of over a hundred publications that did this kind of work. In my residency, I had never heard of this kind of analysis before for talking about autoregulation. Um, and there are a lot of you know, issues with how it's implemented. Everyone's kind of doing it on their own, but it is something that's well known in the engineering literature, in the physiology literature, and it has other applications in cardiovascular control and respiratory. So we decided to um, take this approach to um, looking at um, the problem of autoregulation. Our hypothesis was that the transfer function gain, remember the gain function that we talked about that linked the input and the output, when we do this calculation fairly early in a critical care period can help us to predict patient outcome. So again, here we have our blood pressure. We have this black box system. It's a linear system and it's, um, the function is called the transfer function. And here's our output, which is our blood flow. It's a patient specific data generated model. And we found that with just 48 hours of data, we were able to distinguish between patients who did well and who did poorly. So we, um, had uh, we looked at 77 patients, we included all patients who had subarachnoid hemorrhage, traumatic brain injury, and at least 12 hours worth of data. Each of them had a hemodex uh, probe placed in a white, the white matter away from the area of injury in a standard fashion. Um, and we collected the blood pressures and the blood flows. And then we looked at um, window lengths of 12, 24, and 48 hours. Obviously we had no controls because this is an invasive procedure in sick patients. We had four categories of outcome, poor and good, and then the in-between that went to skilled nursing or to rehab. The good patients went home and then the poor outcome patients died. We did pre-processing um, in order to um, deal with the fact that we were working with real-time data um, lots of uh, places where there would be no recording or um, recordings that made no sense. We did filtering for that. And we needed to um, create data blocks that matched between our blood pressure and our blood flow. Um, for example, if the patient was getting um, personal care or went to the CT scanner, obviously we wouldn't have recordings during that time. This is just the algorithm by which we could um, calculate this transfer function. And it's a relationship um, between the blood pressure and our frequency assessment, our blood flow, the, freq the frequency uh, domain estimate, and then kind of a covariance, a relationship between the two. And it helps to reduce imp the impact of outliers. This is, this is clearly something uh, fully within the control systems literature that we would not normally have access to. This is the way we dealt with the data. We had um, continuous data, sometimes five to 10 days worth of continuously um, acquired data. We would divide this into um, data blocks over the, the time windows that we were looking at. For a single patient then, we would take each 10 minute block and um, generate an estimate of that gain. So we would do that across all of the number of blocks that they had and then come up with an average gain for them during that, that time window. And then by outcome, we would then average them across all of the groups. 
So here's, an, um, here's our results across all groups. We have frequency along the x-axis and we have our transfer function along the y-axis. Red obviously is poor outcome, green is good outcome. And you can see there are some uh, in-between results over here. You can see, especially for low frequencies, that um, there's a lot more um, uncertainty. But if you look just at the good and the poor outcomes, you see that there's a distinct difference. And um, you can calculate p-values related to this. And we were able to calculate that for every single frequency. And you can um, separately consider, this is just looking at the input function. By doing this calculation of the transfer function, does it give us any, um, any information? And so you can see this is what the input and output look like if you just directly look at them in the frequency domain. Um, and this is what the blood flow looks like, starting to look um, like it's separating a little bit um, more between the poor and the good outcomes. And then um, this is just uh, to show that the p-values were significant over 48 hours. So at 12 hours, um, we certainly had p-values that were not significant. But if we went to 48 hours, that we could see that it was significant um, in every way, including the maximum uh, p-value at a, at a frequency. And then this was just uh, related to whether there was um, sufficient information just in the, the raw signals versus actually calculating the transfer function. So you can see at 48 hours, the transfer function really did tell us something significant. Here we looked at the transfer function gain over 12, 24, and 48 hours um, for the good and the poor outcome. And it's statistically significant at every time window, but at 48 hours, it was really the best. You can do other statistical tests on this. Um, we looked at median, for example, to um, discount outliers. You can do leave one out analysis. Um, we had a question about TBI versus subarachnoid hemorrhage. The problem was that um, in patients with traumatic brain injury, um, we only had three patients who actually went home directly as opposed to going to rehab. Um, so the, the things that are very exciting about this pilot study is that we were able to do this prediction with only 48 hours of data. Um, the Hemodex probe has some limitations that there may be some drift, but usually within a couple of days, um, that hasn't been as much of um, uh, an issue. And you can set up a, a, an analysis so you can be continually um, making these calculations and automatically. The limitations, obviously, if we talk about outcomes, we're not distinguishing um, patients who proceeded to brain death. Um, they could have had withdrawal of care. Uh, we had no controls and um, uh, more detailed subset analysis wasn't done. The next steps would be to do a larger study, a prospective study. Um, and I think it's an example of, we talk about translational medicine now, this isn't um, strictly a basic research uh, bench work kind of thing, but it is um, bringing in a different perspective and how that can apply to clinical practice. Um, this is work with my colleagues uh, back in, in New Mexico, especially Dr. Oishi, who's a very well-known control systems um, uh, electrical engineer and our students, and Dr. Jonas, who was my chair back then. Um, there was an article in the New York Times this week um, that I thought was uh, very appropriate. Are you confused by scientific jargon? So are scientists. And uh, number one, I hope that this wasn't just a lot of jargon that is overwhelming. Um, but um, also, I think that by understanding a little bit of terminology um, in any new approach, we might be able to apply that to um, our problems. And uh, here's the Lakefront, Lakefront Trail in Chicago. 
And thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this. Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Papu. This is great. I have some comments in the chat. I'm going to go to Dr. Freeman, then Dr. Fox, and then Dr. Valero. Dr. Freeman, comments and questions, please. Yes. Uh, thanks, Dr. Q. Um, Dr. Papu, that was really an amazing talk and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I think the last time I've, I've seen a talk like this, I think we brought uh, Peter Smolowski from Cambridge um, on this. And um, yeah, uh, admittedly, I am uh, love mathematics and a uh, beautiful presentation. Um, my question um, is um, with the emergence of, uh, you know, um, the Moberg and Cambridge systems, do, do you see a role where this becomes a little easier for translational scientists using, you know, um, machine learning or software methods to record this in the near ICU? Yeah, I mean, the Cambridge group uh, is definitely the, um, the OG, as they say, um, for this kind of work. I mean, they're their um, body of work is so remarkable. And as I was um, making this talk, I thought, you know, I should have just gone and spent six months with them and just really absorbed everything that they do. Um, so this was actually data that was captured on the Moberg system. And um, the thing that um, I think allows us, so I had a couple more slides, just I put them at the end, is, is the, the notion of collecting telemetry data and um, you know we have a paper chart from old, and our EMR is still basically a version of a paper chart. So we have like you know a recording of uh, blood pressure one per hour, and um, you know we're discarding a lot of the data. And um, so this was kind of the thing that we had. And here's the Moberg system. You can do an offline analysis, but um, and uh, we. We had these multimodal um, set up and everything um, and collecting a lot more data. So it turns out um, when I came to Loyola, I learned that I don't know how your telemetry uh, works, but there's a whole back end to Epic and um, all that data is there. It's really just a matter of um, designing a portal with your IT people and you can automatically collect any data that you have and, and keep it. And um, absolutely, it can be done um, with applications to machine learning. Um, it is absolutely um, set up to do that because you know it's time that we start to be able to bring that more directly into um, our ICU and to be able to predict. I mean, it's, it's actually like, just a nice way and, and with just a little bit of the jargon, you can start to feel comfortable about what um, you're assessing. Thank you. Thank, and, thank and, you. And, and I know Dr. Freeman is very familiar with the work and you are too, Dr. Babu, with the work at the San Francisco General. I remember when I was a resident and Jeff Manley uh, was my chief resident. He was as a resident who was already beginning to use a ICU as a laboratory and since then they got multiple grants and a lot of work between neurology and neurosurgery and those endeavors so I agree with you that we have an opportunity and then link back to the uh, the paper trails everybody knows that it was Dr. Cushing who originally invented the the monitor and you probably have a slide somewhere around there the whole chart right there so that's the paper chart he was the creator he was a neurosurgeon who began to take notes Amazing. To hit somebody with, with the Beautiful. I, I go to Dr. Fox because he had some, I saw some uh, chats and thank you, Dr. Freeman. Go ahead, Dr. Fox. Uh, thanks, Dr. Q. And thank you, Dr. Papu. Great talk. Very interesting. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, Dave, as, as he often does, because he's a lot smarter than I am, he scooped me <laughs> on the question. Um, <laughs> so mine, my comments a little bit similar because uh, I was previously at UF and, and we were looking at ways to collect all the ones and zeros that are floating around from these machines in the ICU um, that previously, you know, unless you were looking at the chart that minute, you missed, right? And so um, my question to you um, is, you know, again, sort of on the machine learning side, but do you think there will be a role in the future for, um, you know, incorporating this to, to create non-invasive monitors um, to, you know, to predict outcomes in the ICU and also to identify which patients who have the same sort of 
you know, um, phenotypic presentation, you know, who will do better, who will do worse, you know, because particularly in third world countries and developing countries where um, all these very fancy invasive monitoring techniques are not available, that would be super helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think that you don't have to go to a third world country in order to find a, a, a sharp drop off. You can go to, you know, yeah, an a community ICU, hospital <laughs> a, and a community hospital or a hospital that's not a university center and that has residents and that you see that, um, you know, we, we know Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, GCS of eight or less, that you should be placing a monitor. Um, but, uh, you know, with residents, they're quite enthusiastic about doing that. If it's just an attending, you know, getting out of bed to, to do that just seems a lot less um, uh, interesting. But I think that um, being able to do non-invasive non -invasive assessments is going to be really um, important. I think there are lots of interesting technologies. Um, maybe later, I think I'm, I'm scheduled to talk to you later. You know, one of the questions I had was, you know, we had um, eight attendings that worked in New Mexico and we, we followed a fairly strict protocol for um, all the patients, you know, with TBI, especially, for example. And um, of the eight, seven people just followed that same protocol. And, but the eighth would say, you know, I don't think that the pressure is high in that patient, so let's not place a monitor. And so my question was, you know, we all know, like, is there an imaging study that does not have elevated ICP? And we kind of were like, yeah, this is somebody who's, you know, a little elderly, who has atrophy and, um, you know, make decisions based on that. And that's what they do in places that don't have um, additional resources, um, you know, to the point that um, being able to do telemedicine also um, you need to be able to have ways to gather data um, remotely. So you can say like, you know, this patient scan, their physiology looks okay. You can keep them there and then we can monitor it and then transfer them if there is an issue. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And then of course, to make things even more confusing, there's there was a it was a Randy Chestnut's trial looking at uh, ICP monitoring invasively exactly. versus not invasively. There was no difference, so I'm not sure that's the result he was expecting. But um, obviously, uh, difficult to sort out. I think um, a lot I of think controversy. More we take advantage sure. of this kind of big data. But I think that Chris, uh, I think that illustrates that we just don't understand patient selection. I mean, that's really because we all know anecdotally that this is very useful. You just don't know. We don't know. It's just like what we do in cancer, right? We now begin to understand that not all glioblastomas are the same. You know, they have different molecular markers, probably the same thing, the compliance in the brain, all these mathematical equations. They're excellent. They're universal. But the problem is that the patient selection is so poor, you know, what yeah, we no, understand. I, I think you're absolutely right. And unfortunately, we have a ton of information that mm -hmm. up to very recently has just been going by the wayside we still correct fall back on things like a paper chart and, and going in on rounds and saying and making a decision for the day based on a five-minute assessment when there's 24 7 information being collected so hopefully that's changing thank you one last comment actually by dr valero who actually trained in israel and he's spending time with us you know here and uh, in the, another department, Dr. Valero Fidel. And then I have a question, actually, it's interesting. I have a comment from Dr. Vargas from Bucaramanga from Colombia. It says, how to use the data that we use is something that we need to learn. I mean, learning to do and learning to use the data that we have, it's, it's crucial. Thank you, Gabriel. That's a very powerful statement and comment. Fidel, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Q, thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. And first of all, thank you very much for this talk, Doctor. Uh, I think, um, uh, this uh, data collection is something available, as Dr. Fox and Dr. Q mentioned, because first of all, it's like uh, it's available for to expand our, our horizons in terms of research, in terms of understanding things that uh, is very important to understand things that we think we understood before, but uh, maybe it's not uh, it's not uh, it's not the case. So we get to know 
uh, things the way it should be. And also we expand the horizon for, for new research, for new, for new devices, as Dr. Fox uh, mentioned. So <clears throat> uh, I think in resume, this is uh, unavailable for us and especially for, uh, for people who, um, who is seeking for innovation in every aspect of medicine of, of daily work. So thank you very much for the talk, Re really unavailable for us. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, listen, Dr. Papa, I know that you have some other meetings with our teams coming up right here. We're running a few minutes late, but I will see you, I think, at 9 a.m. Or, or 9.15 or something like that. You know, I have it on my schedule. Between now and then, we got to get the ORs going and things. So, great. Have a great day, everybody. Have a wonderful week. Thank uh, you so week. much. Thank you for being here with us. We'll send you the PDF of all our uh, updates from the week as well, and we'll send it to all the team members. So, have a great week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.